Chapter 37 The Banquet Sit here, Queen Etheldreda barked sharply at Jenna, pointing to a small, uncomfortable gold chair. The chair had been set next to Queen Etheldreda's generously upholstered throne, which dominated the top table set up on the days of the banquet hall. Queen Etheldreda was not a generous hostess, and gave as few banquets as possible. She considered them a waste of both good food and precious time, but sometimes they had to be done. The queen had been taken by surprise at the speed at which the news of the return of the drowned princess had spread, not only through the palace but also through the entire castle. However, along with the news, a certain opinion put out by the knight of the day was gaining a worrying foothold. Many thought that the queen was displeased to see her poor returned daughter, and had locked her away, and what was worse, from the look upon her face when she had first beheld her dear drowned one, anyone would have thought that she had wished her daughter dead. Or, and this was delivered in hushed tones after much looking over the shoulder to check for eavesdroppers, people whispered that the queen had drowned the child herself. The imparting of this news was invariably accompanied by gasps of dismay and amazement, followed by an overpowering wish to find someone else to tell it to, and enjoy the dismay and amazement all over again. The gossip had spread faster than a forest fire, and by nightfall Queen Etheldreda knew she had to do something, fast, and so the palace scribes were set to work on writing the invitations to a magnificent banquet being a thanksgiving for the safe return of our beloved daughter, Princess Esmeralda. Bring your own plates. The hastily assembled throng gathered outside the great doors to the ballroom, the largest room in the palace where all banquets were held. Jenna nervously perched on the wobbly gold chair and surveyed all before her. She shook her head, trying to get rid of the bizarre feeling she had had ever since she had jumped through the glass, that she was actually at home in her own time, and in the middle of one of Silas's extended practical jokes. Jenna still remembered fondly her sixth birthday, when she had woken to find that she was on a board a ship bound for, as Silas had put it, Birthday Island. The whole room had been made to look like the inside of an extremely untidy ship. Her brothers were dressed as pirates and Sarah as the ship's cook. When Simon had shouted out, Land ahoy! Everyone had climbed down a rope ladder hung precariously from the window to a real boat waiting for them below in the river, which had taken them to a small sand pit upriver, where Jenna discovered a treasure chest with her birthday present inside it. However, Jenna thought ruefully as she stole a look at the queen. She could not imagine the mother of poor Esmeralda and the little princesses pretending to be a ship's cook for a day. It seemed to be almost too much for her to pretend to even like her supposed daughter. Jenna turned around and stole a quick glance at Sir Hereward. She felt better seeing the old ghost standing behind her, still on guard. He caught Jenna's eye and winked. Jenna watched Queen Etheldreda take her place on the throne. The queen sat down as if she was expecting a nasty surprise to have been left on the chair. Sitting bolt upright as though someone had tied her to a plank, Etheldreda settled herself onto the throne, a lavishly gilded chair upholstered in deep red velvet and dripping with gemstones. The eye eye scuttled under the throne and curled its tail around one of the carved legs, flicking its tooth in and out and staring at the tasty angles passing by. Stonily, the queen's hooded violet eyes stared at the great doors at the end of the ballroom, which were still firmly closed against the rising hubbub outside. Jenna stole a glance at the living Etheldreda. She thought that the queen looked remarkably like her ghost. The same steely gray plates were coiled tightly around her ears, and the same pointy nose sniffed the air in the familiar disapproving manner. The only difference was that the living Etheldreda smelled of old socks and camphor, Suddenly, the unforgettable voice drilled out, Let the rabble in! Two little boys, door pages for the night, and up well past their bedtime, ran and heaved on the golden door handles, pulling the doors open in unison, as they had practiced under the stern eyes of the royal doorkeeper for the last four hours. A most exotic and highly polished group of people began to file into the ballroom, two by two, each one clutching a plate. As each pair came through the doors, their gaze turned immediately to the returned princess, and even though Jenna had become used to being stared at during her walks around the castle in her own time, she began to feel very self-conscious. She flushed bright pink and could not help but wonder if anyone was going to notice that she was not Esmeralda. But no one did. A few people thought that Esmeralda appeared in much better health than she had been, and looked not surprisingly much happier for her time away from her mamma. Gone was the drawn look to her face the anxious frown that always hovered over her eyes, 
she had filled out a little too, and no longer looked in need of a good meal or two. For having sent an invitation with such short notice, Queen Etheldura had rustled up an impressive-looking group of guests. Everyone wore their very best set of clothes. Most wore their wedding clothes, although the more scholarly ones, particularly the ordinary wizards and the alchemists, wore their graduation gowns adorned with fur and richly colored silks. The royal courtiers and officials, noses in the air, strutted importantly through the ballroom doors in their ceremonial robes. These were made from dark gray velvet edged in red, and were adorned with long gold ribbons that hung from the sleeves, the number and length of which depended upon the status of the officials. On the robes of important officials, the ribbons reached the floor, and on the robes of extremely important officials, the ribbons trailed along on the floor and were often, accidentally on purpose, stepped on. It was not unusual to see a long gold ribbon lying forlornly in the palace corridors, and some officials had even taken to carrying spare ribbons with them, for the number of ribbons on one's sleeves was highly significant, and it would not do for a five-ribbon official to be seen with only four, or perish the thought, three. Jenna watched the sumptuous stream of guests pour in and find their places at the three long tables that were set down the length of the ballroom. After much fussing and treading on ribbons, all were finally seated. A small, nervous page was pushed onto the dais by the steward. The boy ran to the middle, stood on his spot in front of the queen, and rang a small handbell. The tinkling sound immediately brought complete silence. Everyone stopped their chat in mid-sentence and looked expectantly at Queen Etheldida. "'Welcome to this feast!' Etheldida's voice rang back through the ballroom like fingernails being dragged down a blackboard. Some people winced. Others ran their fingernails across their front teeth to get rid of the nasty sensation. "'Held in honor of the safe return of my dear daughter, Princess Esmeralda, whom we all did think sadly drowned, who was much mourned by her dear mamma, and who has been welcomed home with most great rejoicing and motherly affection, for we have not been out of each other's sight since her return, have we, my darling one?' Queen Etheldida gave Jenna a sharp kick on the shins under the table. Ouch! gasped Jenna. Have we, my darling one? Etheldida's eyes bored into Jenna, and she hissed under her breath. Answer, no, mamma, you little fool, else it shall be the worse for thee. With all eyes upon her, Jenna did not dare refuse. No, mamma, she muttered sulkily. What was that, my most precious one? asked Queen Etheldula silkily with steels in her eyes. What did you say? Jenna took a deep breath and said, No, Mama, indeed, the sight of you is haunting. And then immediately she wished she hadn't, for all eyes were now upon her at the sound of her strange accent and her odd way of speaking. But Queen Etheldula, who had made a habit of never listening to a word that Princess Esmeralda said, appeared not to notice. Bored with having to think about the wretched Esmeralda for longer than she had ever had to before, the queen stood up. With much scraping of chairs, everyone in the ballroom rose to their feet and turned their respectful gaze away from the odd Esmeralda to their more familiar queen. "'Let the banquet begin,' Etheldura commanded. "'Let the banquet begin,' responded the guests. After making quite sure that the queen was already seated, the throng sat down, and an expectant buzz of chatter began again. Jenna had been worried about the prospect of having to talk to Queen Etheldura, but she need not have concerned herself, for the queen did not look once in her direction for the rest of the banquet. Instead, she directed her attention to the dark-haired young man sitting to her left. The man, Jenna noticed, did not wear the royal red, but wore a striking black and red tunic emblazoned with a dazzling amount of gold. He kept glancing at Jenna with a puzzled look, but with Queen Etheldura between them, the young man seemed unwilling to say anything. With little else to do, for the bumptious Burrell of Lard sat on her right, and taking his cue from the queen was also ignoring her. Jenna occupied her time listening to the acrimonious conversation between Etheldura and the young man, and was amazed to hear him call the queen Mama. A gong sounded. An expectant silence fell upon the hungry crowd. This was the announcement of the first of fifteen courses. They licked their lips, shook out their napkins, and almost as one, tucked them under their chins. The little door pages heaved open the doors, and a long line of serving girls in pairs, each one carrying two small silver bowls, filed in. On entering the ballroom, the girls divided up, one line to serve each table. 
In a tide of gray, the girls swept along the tables, each depositing a bowl in front of an eager diner. The last two girls to enter the ballroom made their way up to the dais, and soon Jenna, too, had a small silver bowl in front of her. Curious, Jenna looked down at the bowl and gasped in horror. A young duckling, scarcely big enough to be out of the egg, lay in a puddle of thin brown broth. The duckling had been marinated in wine, plucked, and its little naked, goose-bumpy body was slumped in the bowl. Its head rested on a small ledge that stuck out from the special duckling bowl and gazed with terrified eyes at Jenna. It was still alive. Jenna was nearly sick on the spot. Queen Ethelgerda, on the other hand, looked very pleased at the sight of her duckling. The queen licked her lips, remarking to the young man on her left that this was one of her favorite dishes. There was nothing like a tender young duckling freshly scalded in hot orange sauce. The gong sounded for the second time, announcing the arrival of a long line of boys carrying jugs of boiling hot sauce. Jenna watched the boys enter the ballroom two by two, one line going to the right and one to the left, each boy stopping to pour some of the orange sauce into the waiting bowls of the din diners. The two boys at the end of the line with the hottest jugs of sauce were ordered straight up to the dais. Quickly, before the sauce boy reached her, Jenna picked the duckling out of her bowl and thrust it into her tunic pocket, where the tiny creature lay in the soft fluff at the bottom of her pocket, rigid with terror. Jenna watched the boys thread their way through the throng, eyes down trying to avoid spilling the brimming jugs of hot sauce. They stepped up onto the dais where a burly footman hissed in their ears. Tarry not, serve the queen and princess Esmeralda first. And so it was that, when Jenna looked up to politely thank the boy who had just poured orange sauce into her duckling-free bowl. She found herself looking into the haunted eyes of Septimus Heap. Jenna looked away. She did not believe it. This boy with the long, straggly hair, thin in the face and somewhat taller than she remembered, could not possibly be Septimus, not in a million years. Septimus, for his part, had expected to see Princess Esmeralda, so that was who he saw. He was annoyed with himself for thinking, for a few hopeful seconds, that the princess could possibly be Jenna. He had already been fooled like that once before, when Princess Esmeralda had stayed with Marcellus just before she disappeared. He wasn't going to let it happen again. Carefully, Septimus poured the orange sauce into her bowl, grateful that for some reason she did not have a small live duckling in there. Suddenly there was a loud crash and a collective gasp of horror mixed with glee rose from the ballroom. At the sight of the duckling in Queen Ethelgerda's bowl, Hugo had dropped the jug and the boiling orange sauce had spilled into the queen's lap. Ethelgerda leaped to her feet, screaming. The bumptious burrell of lard threw back his chair and grabbed Hugo by the neck and lifted him bodily off the ground, half-throttling him. "'You little fool!' yelled the burrell of lard. "'You will pay for this. You will regret this moment for the rest of your life, which will not be long, boy. Mark my words!' Hugo's eyes were wide with fear. He dangled helplessly from the burrell of lard's pudgy hands, which were tightening around his neck. Septimus saw that his lips were turning blue. Hugo's eyes rolled up, and a great expanse of white began to show. Septimus leaped forward. Using more strength than he knew he had, he pulled the boy from the pudgy hands, yelling, "'Let him go, you fat fiend!' The sound of Septimus's voice rang through the ballroom with more effect than he had intended. Jenna jumped from her seat. She had been watching the steward throttle Hugo with as much horror as Septimus had been, and now she knew— it was Septimus. It was his voice. She knew his voice anywhere. It was him. At the same time, the young man sitting on the other side of Queen Ethelgerda also jumped up. He, too, knew his apprentice's voice. What was the boy doing here dressed as a palace servant? Jenna and Marcellus Pye collided in the melee on the dais. Marcellus slipped on the puddle of orange sauce and crashed to the ground. The bumptious burrell of lard lost his battle with Septimus and let go of Hugo, who dropped to the ground dazed from his grip. Seizing her opportunity, Queen Ethelgerda, dripping with orange sauce, aimed a swipe at the boy. She missed and caught the burrell of lard a stinging blow across his ear. The burrell of lard, who was an aggressive man, automatically gave Ethelgerda a slap in return, much to the glee of those assembled in the ballroom, who were watching enthralled, ducklings poised midway to their gaping mouths. The burrell of lard suddenly realized what he had done and turned white, then ashen gray. He gathered up his sauce-stained robes and fled the banquet, tearing down through the tables. His 
ten precious gold ribbons flying out behind him. The door pages saw him coming, and thinking that this happened at every banquet, they ceremoniously opened the great doors for the fleeing Burrell, and bowed as he shot past them. As they pushed the doors closed, the pages grinned at each other. No one had told them a banquet was this much fun. Hanging on to the dazed Hugo with one hand, Septimus grabbed Jenna by the other. "'It is you, Jen, isn't it?' he asked, his eyes shining with excitement. A wonderful feeling of hope and happiness at seeing Jenna again swept over Septimus. He felt as if he had been given back his future. "'Yep, it's me, Sep. Can't believe it's you, though. Marcia found my note, didn't she? What note? Come on, let's get out of here while we can.' No one noticed the two serving boys and Princess Esmeralda leave the fray. They left behind them a bevy of palace servants attending an angry Ethelgeda, who was barking at Marcellus Pye, demanding that he get up this very minute. To the tumultuous sound of the ballroom in an uproar, uproar, they tiptoed out a small door in the paneling at the back of the days that led to a retiring room for royal ladies, who wished to rest from the effects of eating and drinking too much. Jenna bolted the door and leaned against it, looking at Septimus in disbelief. The duckling stirred, and a small puddle of dampness leaked through her tunic pocket. There was no doubt about it, thought Jenna. The duckling was real, and so amazingly was Septimus.'